You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the murder of a mom who tried to cure her gay son. This involves millionaires, mania, and murder, and it's a family unlike any I have seen before. It teaches you such an important lesson, and this is a case that was easily solved, but it needs to be learned from. By the way, I post so much content like this. It's my absolute passion to tell these stories and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if it's something you would like to support me in, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed, give this video a thumbs up, and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1972 in London and the Bakeland family lived in a luxury apartment in Chelsea at 81 Catagon Square and this was 51 year old Barbara Daly and her son who was Anthony or he went by Tony who was a 25 year old at this point. They were wealthy and well known however most of the money did come from Tony's father who was Brooks Bakeland and at the time Brooks and Barbara were no longer together but of course Barbara was still getting child support or she had in the years prior Tony was a little bit too old now but she had in the years prior gotten that child support from him so they were doing okay with money they had quite a bit of their own ever since Tony was little and even prior to that the Bakeland family this immediate family was very controversial and there were lots of stories told about them and they kind of lived by the notion that bad publicity was still publicity. This is something I don't necessarily believe in, but many do. And so when they heard stories being told about them, when they knew that they weren't the most well-respected, they didn't really mind as long as people were talking about them and still wanting to be around them. However, the biggest media frenzy that this family would be involved in would happen November 17th of that year. Now, Barbara had gone over to her friend that she had known in Spain named Missy, and Missy was now living in London where Barbara was, and so she decided to go to her home and have a dinner and kind of just catch up. And the whole time Barbara was talking about how much she loved her son Tony, how well he was doing, how respectful he was, and at 3.30 she left saying that Tony was actually going to make dinner for her that night, so she needed to get back. And so Missy said goodbye, however, she would get a call from the police and they would be asking when Barbara left her home that afternoon. And Missy was asking why they wanted to know all this information and they couldn't say. However, the police officer would mess up big time when he would ask Missy how she knew the deceased. Barbara had been murdered that evening by stab wounds by a kitchen knife in her own home. And when the maid called the police and they arrived, they found a man standing there holding a knife who was calling Chinese takeaway. He was ordering food and he was simply very calm, acting like nothing had happened. He was none other than Barbara's son, Tony. But he would easily confess to the crime. They didn't have to pry it out of him, even though they knew that he was. There was enough evidence to prove he was the killer. They didn't have to pry it out of him. He simply said he did it. But the question here was why? Was he some natural born killer who was going to kill anyone? Or did he have a motive for his murder? Well, to explain further, we're going to have to go back in time to when the murder victim had been born. And Barbara Daly was born in Boston at West Roxbury to Nina and Frank, who were her parents. And she was said to have a pretty turbulent childhood. At 11 years old, her father Frank would actually commit suicide, or this, this is what was rumored. Now, he had apparently inhaled the exhaust from his car in the garage in order to kill himself with a carbon monoxide poisoning. However, there were many rumors saying that his son and Barbara's brother, Frank Jr., actually saw that he had done this himself, committed suicide. However, it appeared to investigators that this was simply an accident and he had been locked inside. 
but it said that it was supposed to appear like an accident so the family could get his life insurance. It was said that Frank had lost a lot of money in the stock market and he ended up taking his own life because it was the only way he figured his life or his family would be able to live financially and so he thought giving them his life insurance policy would be the only way. Now, once his money came in, Barbara's mother, who was Nini, and Frank Jr. and Barbara all moved to New York City because they had all gotten a pretty decent chunk of money and they began to live at the Delmonico Hotel, which was a pretty expensive luxury hotel in New York City, but this wasn't just random because they had gotten so much money and Barbara's mother had actually decided she was going to look for another suitor who was quite wealthy to help further support the family. Now, when they moved there, they were actually in luck because Barbara would be spotted by an illustrator who would say she was one of the 10 most beautiful girls in New York City. And he would decide that this beautiful, red-haired, gorgeous-eyed girl would be someone he wanted to paint. And so he would do so and he would put this picture up in a huge famous bar in New York. And from there, Barbara would begin to book different modeling gigs and she would even be in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. She was getting modeling contracts left and right and this would be a huge break for her from just moving from Boston to New York and finally she was actually making enough money to buy an apartment where she allowed her family to live in Park Avenue. Barbara was invited to Hollywood to try her hand in acting. They figured she was beautiful. Maybe she would be good at pretending to be somebody else. So they flew her in and they had her participate in a screen test with another actor named Dana Andrews. This was a huge actor at the time and this could have been Barbara's huge break. However, nothing really happened with the screen test. She didn't get the role and after this she decided she didn't really like Hollywood that much and she wanted to go back to New York. So that is exactly where she would go. Although Barbara was a very friendly young woman, she was able to make friends with anyone she knew and so she found herself with a lot of friends in Hollywood as well as contacts. So she knew if she wanted to go back she could. However, she was at the peak of her modeling career as well in New York and so she wasn't doing too bad for herself there. She was getting even more wealthy. She was partying with the celebrities. She had that just natural networking ability with her over-the-top personality and it was said that her mother Nini had actually taught her how to basically flirt with the more wealthy, especially men, and kind of get them to fall for her and that Nini almost raised her to be a duchess. So she was basically born and bred to be in these scenarios and she did succeed at them. However, you know, Nini had gone to New York to marry wealthy herself and I'm not sure she was ever able to find what she was looking for, but she found a new way to survive, her daughter. But Barbara was not her mother. She was said to be very self-assured and her presence would light up a room. By the time she was in her 20s, she was partying with the top celebrities, the most wealthy in the state and in the country, and she really was thriving. And in fact, she had made friends with an artist named Domenico Noli, who was from a very well-off family from Italy. And he was... A really good friend of hers. However, it was said to be more of a friendship based on status than genuine connection, which is always so heartbreaking to me. But when Domenico had died at 35 from lung cancer, Barbara had gone to his funeral and was said to make quite a scene. In fact, she was kind of throwing herself on, you know, wealthy family of his and that she didn't know and sobbing and crying and acting like she did know them and that they were her own family. And this was kind of how Barbara was said to start acting at this point, very 
over dramatic and over the top. Barbara was kind of getting the reputation of latching onto people for the wrong reasons and at one point she started dating John Jacob Astor who was actually a married man but John had said that if Barbara would wait for him to divorce his wife she would be given three million dollars as well as a famous emerald ring as their engagement ring and his wife was named Turkey French and he was going to divorce her. However, he would wait too long to do so. But John Jacob Astor was a very wealthy man himself because his relative was said to be the richest man to go down with the Titanic. But at the same time that John was working on divorcing his wife, Barbara became closer with a friend she had met in Hollywood named Cornelia Bakeland, who went by Dickie. And Dickie's brother was a man named Brooks, who was a trainee pilot in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And Dickie had known Barbara, of course, she knew her brother, and she thought they would be the perfect match. So she decided to set them up. Brooks was told to go to Dickie's place one weekend to meet a pretty girl who was a poet. And he had movie star looks, she wanted to be a movie star, and they both loved to write. A match made in heaven, right? Well, Brooks was the wealthy man that Barbara had been waiting for and so she decided to drop her whole relationship with, with John Jacob Astor and go straight into this relationship with Brooks. Now, Brooks' family, the Bakeland family, were extremely wealthy. In fact, they would be the creators of plastic. Brooks' Belgium grandfather was the chemist that had created Bakelite, which is what he first called plastic. His name was Leo, and this was suddenly used for radios, records, artificial limbs, and everything that we now use plastic for today. They realized that it was so incredibly useful, and so this would turn into a business it was making them millions of dollars. So Brooks had grown up in a really wealthy family and knew no other way of living. It was said that he never really lived up to his father's expectations, but he was a brilliant student who was studying physics and he was going for his PhD. However, he did drop out and he began to write saying that that was his purpose, but he never fully wrote anything, you know, substantial like a novel or anything like that. And it was said that at this time, Brooks kind of became a really arrogant and ignorant man who really didn't care about the value of money. He would often say that he need not please or not seek to please anyone because his grandfather had given him F.U. money. Basically saying that money gave him the ability to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and he didn't care what anybody else thought. Now, his father would actually give Brooks' stepmother all of the money once he died, but he was still doing okay on money, Brooks was, because his grandmother had given him quite a bit. Brooks hadn't expected much from his father anyway because they hadn't even lived together when Brooks was a kid. In fact, in fact Brooks' father had actually lived in another small house with his dogs instead of living with his wife and children. And, you know, Barbara didn't care where Brooks' money was coming from, only that he had it. The only problem was one of Brooks' basically pet peeves, he hated partying and high society partying especially, which was, you know, not gonna work out because Barbara, that's all she did. She was a partier when she wasn't modeling. So suddenly they had to mesh these two lives and make them come together. They weren't said to be the most compatible on an emotional or intellectual level. However, they did both think that they were attractive. The other one was, and I'm sure themselves too. And so that's basically what they went on and had a relationship because of their looks. And they did seem happy together, so nobody really questioned it too much. Although, Brooks would often tell Barbara off, saying that her writing was terrible. And that was only the glimpse into what their relationship was really like. 
which we'll get into in a little bit. But John Jacob Astor, who almost got Barbara, would no longer even talk about her, knowing that Barbara was not his. But Barbara was keeping a secret from Brooks, and this was about her own family. Now, I couldn't come across the exact date, however, at some point, Barbara's brother, who was Frank Jr., had been in Massachusetts with a wife and kids when he would get into a car crash and pass away. This was said to be from driving recklessly, and it was rumored that this was actually a suicide, just like how his father had died, you know, from a suicide in a car. And there were said to be links to him wanting to basically do what his father had done all those years prior, but this was two family members and two possible suicides, and Barbara's mother, Nini, also had a nervous breakdown a few years prior to Barbara being born. There was a lot of mental health issues in this family, and it would only get worse from here. Now, I know social media has caused mental breakdowns to seem like some just trendy thing to do and to have and a title that catches people's eyes, but it's not simply a bad day or not wanting to go to work. It's actually a period of intense mental distress where you are unable to function in everyday life. I mean, you can have depressive symptoms, you can have hallucinations, mood swings, panic attacks, paranoia, flashbacks that are from PTSD. It can be horrific to go through. And Barbara was struggling as well with mental health issues, but she didn't want anybody to know, especially not her wealthy boyfriend. You see, at this time, Barbara was going to a psychiatrist named Foster Kinney, and it's unknown whether she didn't want the public to know and her high status to be revoked or she didn't want her wealthy boyfriend to know her secrets, but this was all kept very, very private. And it's not known what exactly was discussed, but it is known that Foster Kinney had told Barbara she should not have children. Now, we will dive a little bit deeper and to Barbara's dark psyche in a little bit because it does pertain to this story. However, right now we are going to talk more about Barbara and Brooks and their toxic relationship. They would get married in California, but this wasn't just for no reason. They didn't just rush this because they wanted to. This was because Barbara had told Brooks that she was pregnant and Brooks wanted to be a good guy and marry the woman who was having his child. So they immediately went to California and they got married. On the marriage certificate, it said that Barbara was a poet, Brooks was a writer, and they would happily go home as husband and wife. However, then Brooks would find out that their marriage had been started on a lie because Barbara wasn't pregnant at all. She just didn't want to lose Brooks. This is when their relationship was really starting to show that it was in trouble and cracks in the facade of happiness and a relationship that was perfect, they really began to show. So they were now legally married and they moved into an apartment in the Upper East Side of New York. Family and friends were completely unaware of what was happening behind the scenes. They carried on with these extravagant dinner parties with a facade of luxury and happiness, but soon Barbara actually began to crack in front of everybody. And she, it was when she was drinking really heavily and she would become really rude. She would have outbursts and many people at these functions were getting worried about her and they were seeing this side of her they had never seen before. There were rumors swirling around this time that both Barbara and Brooks were having affairs and that they knew about these affairs. But one night at a party, Brooks had actually joked that the next woman who walk in the room, he was going to get with. And Barbara was so angry that she said, well, fine, then the next car that I see with a man inside, I'm going to get in and have an affair with him. But she didn't just talk about this. She actually ran outside and got in a car with four strange men she didn't know. And she would come home a few hours later to Brooks saying that she decided that that isn't what she wanted to do, so she told him to drop her back off. 
but it had been hours later. This tumultuous relationship would become even scarier when Barbara would find out she was pregnant. Now, Brooks, of course, didn't believe her at first because of her track record, but in August of 1946, they would have their first son named Anthony, who they called Tony. And at first, they really did function as a family, focusing on their baby boy but this wouldn't last forever. Tony was said to be a charming young boy who loved nature. He would often go on playdates to the beach with a girl named Princess Yasmin Aga Khan, who had extremely famous parents at this time. And Tony's parents believed he was some sort of child prodigy, that he was so much better than all of the other kids. But the only problem was they couldn't say what exactly he was talented in. It was basically that they wanted him to be some incredible superhuman that he wasn't. He was a chatty child because he had been basically socialized since he was born at these parties that his parents would throw that he would be invited to. He would go with his parents everywhere that he could and his family did continue to have people over. And during this time, they were renting houses in London and Paris so that they could have these parties at different places. And his mother went on to tell her elaborate stories that, you know, got everybody listening, but nobody really knew if they were true. And at the same time, Brooks was off mingling with other women. And Tony was actually often told by his mother to read these books that were well above his maturity level. And they were often in other languages. And again, with the child prodigy thing, if he couldn't read things right, he would often get in trouble for making, you know, them embarrassed of what he couldn't do. When Tony was 14 years old, his father Brooks would actually begin an actual affair with an English diplomat's daughter who was 15 years younger than him and he would say he actually wanted a divorce from Barbara. But Barbara wasn't having this. She wasn't going to let him get away so easily. So she decided to attempt to take her own life. And she survived this. However, after this, Brooks decided that he was going to go back with her to help her heal. And that's what he did. Brooks said Barbara was a wild animal, a flaming, beautiful tigress, and that their fights were often horrendous, that one day they were at a hotel and she wanted to go to her favorite restaurant and he said no. And she actually wrestled him and he got her to the floor, put his foot on her chest, and that is when she bit into his calf and it took 30 minutes for her to actually calm down. Now, Brooks would say that faced with becoming a murderer for the sake of freedom, I gave up my girl, meaning his new young girlfriend. This wouldn't be the last time that Brooks would have an affair though. And while the cheating continued, so did the suicide attempts. At this point, Tony was showing some very disturbing behavior, but it didn't make either of his parents panic. In fact, they thought he was quite brilliant. But some of these behaviors included pulling the wings off of flies to see if they could balance, as well as pulling the legs off of crabs on the beach. And when friends of the family would see him doing this, they would bring it up to them saying that's not normal. But Brooks and Barbara didn't see anything wrong with it. The families were really concerned calling Tony sadistic, but his family just brushed it off saying that that wasn't possible, that this actually made him interested in nature and smart for wanting to explore the bodies of these animals. And he was going to really good schools at the time and he would often be left alone as a teenager to do whatever he wanted as his parents traveled around. By the time that Tony was 20 years old, he would still be hanging out with his family, living with them, but now they were in Switzerland. However, Tony did still go out to places on his own, and so he would travel to a Spanish resort. And this was the first time that his parents would be concerned about him, because he had met this boy 
this Australian named Jake Cooper. Jake actually did have a girlfriend, but he was bisexual and he felt quite a connection to Tony. And so they began to be very inseparable and they began taking hallucinogenic drugs together because Jake lived at this farm full of hippies that often did drugs there as well. Jake was said to be quite a kind of eccentric personality. He had animal bones as necklaces and he um, would often practice black magic and the people that lived at the farm with him kind of followed him thinking he had some magic in him and any spell that he casted would come true. They believed he had caused the death of three people due to these spells so they really did follow him like some sort of leader. But that wasn't necessarily why his parents didn't like Jake. You see, Brooks had known that his son was gay and he kind of just started to disown him after this. However, Barbara wouldn't have it. She wouldn't even believe that her son could like men. Barbara wasn't going to let this continue when she heard about Jake and so she went all the way to the Spanish resort and she picked Tony up. This time, when they tried to go home, they realized that Tony didn't have a passport. And of course, this was gonna cause some trouble, but what would cause them even more trouble was the fact that Barbara would throw this fit that they couldn't leave and would really cause quite a scene, so much so that they would be arrested. They were both handcuffed together, and as they were drug away, Barbara said to Tony, Here you are, darling, at last manacled to mummy. That same year, Brooks and Barbara would officially separate after Brooks was caught with a young girl named Sylvie. This was said to be Tony's girlfriend. You see, Barbara was excited because Tony had, after this whole, you know, thing with Jake, he had started hanging out with a girl, a Spanish girl named Sylvie, and so she was inviting her over all of the time, really excited, thinking that they were going to get married. However, the only two getting physical were Sylvie and Brooks. Barbara would find this out in February of 1968 and she would take a whole bunch of pills as she often did to try to take her life. Unfortunately for her, this would no longer phase Brooks and he would decide to leave her anyway. This was mainly because his new girlfriend Sylvie had seen this happening and that Brooks was going to go back to Barbara because of this and she decided to try to take her own life as well to get his attention back. And this worked because Brooks would decide to treat her instead of Barbara and officially leave his wife. And after this, Brooks wanted nothing to do with Barbara or Tony. Brooks said that Barbara had mischief in her blood and many of their friends said that Tony at this time would spiral even deeper into these strange behaviors and that he was going to college and he was in a still life class where they did paintings and they were supposed to be painting fruit. However, he would be painting humans with blood dripping down them. And his teacher was completely shocked and horrified at this. But Barbara took this painting and was proud of it and began to show her friends what her son had created as though it was this famous masterpiece. Her friends had also seen the way that Tony had been throwing rages, throwing items, especially trying to hurt Barbara, and also creating photos of Barbara decapitated with snakes around her neck. But none of this seemed to phase Barbara. He would also often leave notes in Sylvie and his father Brooks' flower pots outside of their own home saying, Daddy, please daddy, come back to mommy. She's so unhappy. And he wrote this as kind of like a child, but he was in his 20s at this point. From my small knowledge of psychology, I do believe that Tony at this point in his life seemed to possibly have disruptive mood dysregulation disorder or DMDD. And this can appear in children or adolescents where they have severe temper outbursts and can often have a persistent kind of anger to them or irritability in their personality or behaviors. These emotions are strange to the situations that they are in, you know. People do get angry, but these are random times that they're getting angry and they're much more severe than just a child's tantrum. These are rages that are much louder and longer and can't really be stopped until the child is done. 
They can be disruptive to themselves, objects, and others, and are very easily set off. It doesn't have to be a huge thing that can start this. It can basically be anything. And they have trouble with emotions as well as, you know, social environments and interactions. And the cure for this is really said to be a mood stabilizer medication as well as family therapy where they can work on emotional regulation in the homes, which basically means that these children cannot be stopped and it will only get worse as they get older and the family basically just has to find ways to deal with it with very little help. It's said that these children are likely to be pretty miserable and of course the families will be too having to deal with it and it's unknown what really causes this other than the underactivity of the amygdala and the brain. However, it's said that DMDD is an umbrella term for those children with severe behavioral and mental issues that professionals don't want to to yet label and basically it means that it's the precursor of a sociopath, a psychopath, be have schizophrenia or be a narcissist and many other different you know mental issues, mental illnesses and the thing is DMDD was kind of created in a way so that these children don't have to be looked at as evil. And like we talk about often on this channel, many people don't like to label children as evil or believe that they can be killers or believe that they can be monsters. And so, of course, they're not going to label one of them a monster if they don't believe that they can be. However, we know from this channel and the, the cases that we've seen that they can be. Now, of course, when Tony was a child, this wasn't even a known thing. DMDD didn't exist. In fact, it came about in the 1990s. But the thing is, and not everybody with DMDD or even not everybody with schizophrenia or any of those other mental illnesses are killers or monsters. This is unlike bipolar disorder, DMDD. It's a mood disorder, but it's unlike it because DMDD is a long-term anger and low mood. You know, in bipolar, it's more of the good, 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 bad, 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 good, 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 bad, bad, bad. You know, it's the up and downs, the goods and bads. However, with DMDD, it's almost like you have a set bad Sometimes you can get really bad, but then you go up to bad again and then really bad. So there's not really this manic happiness or these these really good highs in DMDD. You're just constantly at kind of a mute level of low. However, he would get no help for these issues that the friends of Barbara and Brooks were seeing, mainly because Barbara didn't see it and Brooks didn't believe in psychiatry and he thought it was immoral and he just said his son was evil and that was that. The only problem with her son was that he was attracted to men. At this point, Tony would move with Barbara to London by themselves because Brooks had married Sylvie and actually had a child with her. So they moved to London together and at this time, Tony was getting even worse, threatening her, choking her, threatening her with knives. He would rage and throw things at her. But Barbara was still treating him as though they were best friends and that he wasn't trying to harm her and he would begin to do drugs with her. They would, you know, do these drugs while hanging out and she would also hire female sex workers for him because she believed that that would change who he loved. They were quite toxic for one another. They had a kind of dependence on one another that is unlike anything a mother and son should have. And this is when the story would take an even darker turn because Barbara was said to tell her sister-in-law you know, I could get Tony over his homosexuality if I just took him to bed. It's unknown if this really happened. Many of Barbara's friends said that she had told them this. However, she would often make up these elaborate stories in order to shock them or make them think she was some crazy eccentric woman and that most of the time they weren't true. Either way, just saying that is simply disturbing and there were also pictures found hung in Barbara's bedroom of Tony who was naked in the bathtub and Tony had even been said to tell a friend he was effing his mother 
and he didn't know what to do. At this point, Barbara had started a creative writing class and she began to write a novel about a mother's sexual relationship with her son. She also invited the class over to see her naked photos of Tony. Now the date is unknown, but I would say around this time, Tony was taken to a psychiatric clinic after Barbara had come home one day and found him with a knife rocking back and forth and she couldn't get him to come out of it. He was, you know, in a delusional state and he scared his mother. And, you know, he, during the time at the psychiatric clinic, was said to be very guarded and he had talked to therapists, but they didn't really get much out of him. And so six weeks later, Barbara said she could no longer afford the treatment and he had to be discharged. After this, while at home, he would begin to be even more aggressive. He would beat Barbara unconscious, even doing it when Barbara had guests over. He didn't care. He would beat them too if they tried to stop him. And he would actually be treated in home by a psychiatrist named Dr. Dr. Jacobs, who would diagnose him with schizophrenia. And, you know, Dr. Jacobs recommended that he was put in a mental institute, but yet again, this would cost money that Barbara didn't have. And so, the abuse continued and Tony had tried to stab his mother or blind her by stabbing her with a pin in the eye. Now it was the middle of 1972 in July and Tony was 25 years old. He would be, you know, living in the apartment with his mother still and Barbara would come home a little bit later and that is when she would come home, open the door, take her coat off and be attacked and she couldn't see what was happening, only that she was basically being shoved outside. She had run for the steps while being attacked and the attacker just started shoving her even more down the steps, grabbing onto her hair. And at this point she grabbed for the gate and was clinging to it, but this attacker was kind of beating her fingers, trying to get her to release the gate and she would break her thumb in three different places. This man would then run into the house to grab a knife and come back out screaming that any woman nearby was going to get it. And Barbara couldn't get up. She was about 50 years old at this time. She couldn't really get up, but thankfully her friend came to her rescue. However, she would then still be thrown into the street by this man who shoved her down and she was almost run over by traffic. The only thing that broke Barbara's fall was her big hair that she had at the time and at this point it would cause such a scene that the police would finally get involved and they would arrest this attacker who was still at the home because this was none other than Tony. They would arrest him for attempted murder, but Barbara would not press charges against him. However, he would be admitted to the Priory, which is a private psychiatric hospital but once again, he was discharged. He would continue seeing Dr. Jacobs at the home and the psychiatrist was very concerned. He would be telling Barbara on October 30th that she was at grave risk and that he believed Tony would kill her. And Barbara didn't believe him at all. So Dr. Jacobs took it into his own hands, called the police department and said, look, something bad is going to happen at that apartment. You need to have an officer there. And they said, well, we can't do that. No crime has been committed. There's no sign of a crime that's going to be committed. We can't. It was then November 15th and Barbara and Tony would go see Dr. Jacobs together and they would decide that it was time to put Tony in some sort of hospital and Tony agreed to this as well. So they were going to set it up five days later on November 20th. They were going to get him a bed. It would take some time, but he would be admitted November 20th and the day after this appointment they went on with their lives. Barbara went to see a friend for lunch where this friend would tell Barbara to be careful of her son and she said that Tony would never harm her. She'd also written a letter to a friend saying that, you know, Tony was getting better but it was still heavy, which no one really knows exactly what that means. The very next day would be when Barbara was found dead and Tony was in her apartment holding the knife and Tony would be imprisoned at the Brixton prison and that is when we would find out exactly what happened that evening and this is Tony's side of the story so we don't know if this is exactly true but he would write this in a letter to his grandmother Nini. He would say that when Barbara came home that evening 
he had told her that a friend was coming over for dinner as well and, and she was very angry because she didn't want anyone else at the home and he had said that he had invited this friend because he had gotten a strange phone call from them saying that they fell down an elevator shaft so he invited them over for dinner. It was not confirmed if this was true or not, or if this was a delusion that Tony was having, but he said after this, after they were fighting him and Barbara, she ran to get a piece of paper and was writing something, and this made him angry, so he hit her, and then he started chasing her to the kitchen, where he, he said that his mind was slightly wacky and that he was under the influence of his mother and that she was controlling his mind. And that's when he said he picked up the knife and without hesitation, he stabbed her right in the heart. He said he still adored his mother and yet there were past memories flooding his mind and he felt a sort of relief she was gone and that there was a weight off of his shoulders. Tony would undergo intense psychiatric treatment at this hospital with high security, but the psychiatrist said he appeared to be normally anxious and depressed, that he was confused about what happened the night of the murder and that he sometimes didn't even know what happened and he would often ask visitors how his mother was. He would be put on trial and found guilty of manslaughter and put into the Broadmoor Hospital. Now, the staff there were very concerned about him saying that he his behavior wasn't really changing, he was very unstable. However, he was very good at making people from the outside world believe that he was completely okay and that he shouldn't be in this hospital. He would write to them and get them to think that he was in prison for something he didn't do. He was in a right state of mind and he didn't do any of this. Brooks's father was the only person who didn't believe this and said he was an enormous failure of intelligence and that he was unstable. However, Tony's grandmother, Nini, completely believed all of these letters and wanted to get him out. She believed that even though he had possibly murdered her daughter, that she could love the rage out of him. And as we all know, that's not true. Eight years later, Tony would be released due to the powerful friends of the family that Nini had and he would fly to New York to live with her. Brooks had tried to stop this, but 87-year-old Nini fought even harder and wanted him in her home. But Tony, who was 33 at this time, as soon as he got there, he was showing signs of being extremely aggressive and he was aggravated, he was screaming, he was cussing, he was throwing things, and he was actually so bad, he was scaring Nini's maids who would quit at this time. Tony didn't sleep, and instead he built a shrine of his mother while he mumbled over her ashes, and six days after being there, his grandmother Nini would be found badly injured. She had eight stab wounds, Thankfully, they hit bone, every single one of them, so she wasn't badly injured as much as they thought she would be, and she also had several broken, broken bones, and for an 87-year-old, of course, I'm sure this was going to be a long time to heal, but she did survive. Tony would then again be arrested and charged with attempted murder, and he would be sentenced to Rikers Island Prison, where he would then say that the reason that he had killed his mother and tried to kill his grandmother was because they were both nagging him, trying to tell him what to do. That he killed his mother because she wouldn't leave him alone, and also that his mother was much easier to kill than Nini, who he continued to stab and who just wouldn't die. It was said that Tony had tried to make a call to England and his grandmother said no, so he began to attack her. Tony had even complained to officers who got to the scene that his grandmother wouldn't die. It was also said that Tony confessed to wanting to have sex with his grandmother. Now, the day of the trial of the attempted murder of Nini, it was March 20th, 1981 at 3.30 p.m. and they went to get Tony from his cell only to find him with a plastic bag over his head. He had taken his own life. This was quite ironic considering that his great-grandfather had created that very plastic years prior. Now, 
The story was actually turned into a 2007 film called Savage Grace that's starring, starring Julianne Moore. I didn't watch it because it's said not to be very accurate as far as a actual description of this case. It's just kind of a fictional story about it, but it is out there if you want to watch it. Now, you all know exactly how I feel about people struggling with mental illness being released and discharged before it is safe for them and for others. I often think that it comes down to money or insurance and, and them not having enough money to keep them inside, which is horrific that they can't continue to get that help, or it's family members who are not immediate or even immediate family members who don't want to believe the family members who are saying that they are that bad. I mean, I think it's heartbreaking that Brooks had tried to warn Nini that he was that bad. He was unstable and she continued to think love would fix him. This does happen quite a lot for non-family members and family members who don't see how bad they really are and it's it's heartbreaking for those who see it and are begging them to believe them. Staff said that Tony was unstable, but they couldn't do anything to stop him from going home. I think this whole family had some serious mental health issues that went untreated for so long and the whole family was spiraling into horrific, horrific things. And, you know, I do believe that it was genetic for Tony, his mental issues and I think that his mother's behavior and the possible incest on top of that, you know, it didn't create this. I don't believe, but it did make it worse. And, you know, I, I always like to say, you can go through a very traumatic past, but you choose what you do from that. However, I think when you couple that with mental illness, it's a little bit different because, you know, you don't have all of the capabilities of dealing with it as someone who has a completely healthy mind. But let me know what you think about this case. I know it's a little bit different than the cases that I always do, but I don't know. I thought, I thought you would be interested in hearing about the whole thing and, you know, I'm, I'm not here siding with Barbara. I'm not here siding with Tony. I think this whole family was quite messed up and it's one of the most shocking families I've ever heard about. I think the most heartbreaking part in this case is that his family did not accept him for who he was as far as who he loved and I hope you were staying healthy and happy and don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye!